there is a difficult transition between, between, I should say, a given word problem and the proper arithmetic that solves the problem, right? I think I said the other day, all your students can read English, and all your students can do, hopefully, arithmetic. Again, you wouldn't be asking them to do word problems unless they could already do the arithmetic that is going to come out of the word problem, right? So you're not going to do word problems until they can already do arithmetic. So they can all read, they can all do arithmetic. So why can't they do word problems? Well, it's because they can't bridge it. They can't get from the words to the proper arithmetic. So the bridge we're going to use is a bar diagram that is going to get us there. So if we can go from words and write the, draw the right diagram, and if we can also look at a diagram and interpret the arithmetic <coughs> off of the diagram, then we're all set. Right? So that's why you may have noticed when we talked about arithmetic the other day, we used bars in several occasions. For example, if you recall subtract when we talked about subtraction, we talked about several interpretations. One of them was called the part-whole interpretation, where we know a part and we know a whole and we want to know what's left over. So let's say, I don't know, the whole is uh, 94 and one of the parts is 27. We might want to know what the other part is. So if we introduce subtraction along with bar diagrams, hopefully your students will look at a diagram like this and realize that the correct arithmetic to find the question mark is 94 minus 27. Right? That's the idea. So now when they read a problem and it says there are 94 children in the class, it's a big class, there are 94 children in a movie theater and 27 of them are boys, how many of them are girls? They can draw this picture from those words, and then from this picture, they can interpret the correct arithmetic. And then they get 94 minus 27. I mean, if your students can get that 94 minus 27 directly from the words, that's great. We, we don't need the diagram. The diagram really is, I know I don't want to use the word crutch, but all the models we've been drawing, chip models, they're really crutches. They're really crutches in, that we use until we're ready for the most efficient way to solve a problem. That's what drawings are, right? They're crutches until we're okay with, or until we're comfortable with the most efficient way to solve the problem. So these drawings and these models are more for the students that have a hard time going from the words to the arithmetic. Some of your students, your good students, are going to be able to read that problem and automatically know it's 94 minus 27 and move right on. Okay? But maybe if they can't, this gives a little rich. Okay? So this is like the part full interpretation of subtraction. We also had comparison interpretation of subtraction, right? Say you've got $94, and I've got $27, and we want to know how many more dollars do you have than me, right? The diagram would look something like this, and again, the idea is if we end up with a comparison interpretation, you know, this, if you, I mean, 94 minus 27 is not just necessarily one picture. It depends on the context, right? If it's boys and girls, you'd be more apt to draw a picture like this. If it's comparing two quantities, you'd be more apt to draw a picture like this. This is why, again, we emphasize the interpretations. And so the students realize that both of these diagrams, even though they look different, they both result in the arithmetic 94 minus 27. Okay, also recall that we have a measurement model of multiplication. that says, for example, three times five is three jumps of five on a number line, but the number lines that we use are kind of bar diagrams, so we kind of blow up the number lines. So we say three jumps of five is something like this. And we want to know what's the whole way. Bars like this are going to come up a lot, and we need to recognize, and our students need to recognize, that if one we're going to call these boxes units. Anything that's the same size, we're going to call it a unit. So students need to recognize if one unit equals five, then how do we figure out what three units is? 
That's multiplication, right? And that's the <coughs> interpretation of multiplication. One unit is five, then three units is three times five. Okay? So students be, need to be able to recognize, go from a picture like this to a kind of a write-up like this. <clears throat> Partitive division. We know the whole thing is 20. And we know it's split into four pieces. Students need to be able to recognize when they see a diagram like this, in this case, four of the same units is the opposite of multiplication, right? Division is the opposite of multiplication. In this case, four units is 20, right? 1, 2, 3, 4 of the same unit equals 20. And they need to recognize, if I know what 4 units is, how do I get down to 1 unit? It's part of tip division, right? So they need to recognize that 4 units is 20, then 1 unit is 20 divided by 4, which is 5. Okay. So this, these, all of this is stuff that you emphasize at the very beginning when you're talking about operations, right? Before you've even talked about really anything about subtraction, one of the first things you talk about is interpretations. Maybe you don't use the language, but you draw diagrams like this, and you talk about word problems. Same with multiplication, right? You start with a definition. Definition leads to models. Models lead to pictures, right? So they need to be able to recognize that if they see a picture like this, to go from knowing what one unit is to figuring out what three units is is multiplication. And if they see a picture like this, they need to realize that they know what four units is to go to figure out what one unit is is division. Okay. So all of these kind of skills are prerequisite for our technique. Because what we're going to do in our technique is we're going to read word problems. Our word problems then are going to devolve into some sort of a picture that's going to look similar to these pictures. And then we just have to interpret the picture and arithmetic does the rest of it. We all okay so far? Okay, that's all we need to know. So now we're ready. So this concept of a unit is really important. So the, we, as teachers, we always, we often tell our students, or encourage our students, I should say, to come up with alternate ways to solve problems. And that has many, many benefits, right? Okay, this is one topic where I make my students do one and only way of solving problems. And the reason for that is because of kind of a long-term goal of this model drawing process, okay? Certainly, the process is useful for solving the problems right in front of you, okay? Now, if that's all that it was useful for, then I would be fine with people doing their own thing in terms of drawing pictures, and coming up with solutions to problems, okay? But that's not all that the model drawing technique is useful for. In fact, I could even argue it's far more important as a bridge to algebra, okay? So for that reason, I really want to assist on solving these problems in a very particular way, okay? So when I give you these problems to work on, a lot of those of you that haven't seen this before, you're going to be very tempted to come up with different ways to solve the problem. In fact, a lot of the problems you're going to look at and you're going to say, I cannot do these problems without the algebra. Okay? In fact, oftentimes that's how we start these discussions, is we throw some problems on the board and we say, can you solve this problem without algebra? And oftentimes, if you haven't seen this before, you don't think that you can. Okay? So I really want to emphasize that we are going to try to solve these problems in a very particular way, and I'm going to give you those guidelines here in a bit. Um, but again, the reason why is because if students get used to solving problems in this way, they're basically doing algebra without being told that they're doing algebra. They're basically doing algebra. I mean, there's no x, but really this concept of a unit takes the place of x, okay? So we use the concept of a unit, 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 and then when it comes time, and hopefully we'll get a chance to do this, we might get a chance to do this at the end of the class today, we can make a nice transition between solving a problem with a model drawing and with algebra. Basically, all it involves is thinking of a unit as x, right? So I do want to kind of emphasize, and I'm going to be very careful to do all the problems in a very similar way, and we're always going to really, really focus on units, the concept of a unit. And really, all I mean by a unit is in a diagram, any part of the diagram is the same size, okay? So all of these, even though 
you know, I'm pr I've gotten pretty good over the years at drawing things that are the same size freehand. Um, they're all meant to be the same size, so these are all meant to be exactly the same size. These are all meant to be exactly the same size. Okay, so any box that's the same size is called a unit. Okay. So far so good? All right, so these problems kind of get broken down into categories. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on the lower category, like maybe early problems that are found early on in the third grade book. Problems, we can do model drawing problems that involve addition and subtraction, like this, right? So we, came from, we had 94 children in a theater, 27 of them are boys, how many of them are girls? Okay? And we would draw a picture like this, and then we would recognize the correct arithmetic is 94 minus 27, and then we'd be done. So I'll do a few problems like that, but I'm going to emphasize a little bit more the problems involving multiplication and division. Okay. Now, before we do any problems, let me kind of explain what I meant a couple seconds ago when I was talking about a particular way of solving these problems. Okay? These are what we call teacher solutions. And this is how we want all the problems to look. Now, I give my students kind of blanket instructions at the beginning of the class, and I tell them, when you are handing anything in to me, pretend like you are presenting that in front of a class. So you're not messy, you're not skipping steps, you're not scratching stuff out, you're not doing any of the stuff that you wouldn't do in front of a class. And okay? just basically be neat. Teacher solutions are a little more particular. We want our solutions to have um, kind of certain components involved in the whole left. Um, so maybe I could illustrate this with an actual problem. Let's just dive right in and do an actual problem. <laughs> All right. So this might be a third, fourth grade type of problem. OK, so John weighs three times as much as his daughter. Their combined weight is, say, 288 pounds. Now, notice at this point, I can ask you for a variety of things. What could I ask for? How much does the daughter weigh? Or I could say, ask, how much does John weigh? Or I could ask, how much heavier is John than his daughter? Right? If I was being really, really clever, right? You can ask any of those things. It's completely arbitrary. So I'll, let's, we'll start slow. Let's say, how much does John weigh? So the features of the teacher solution are as follows. There's basically two steps. And when I give these problems to my students, I grade them basically half on presentation and half on, you know, did you do the math correctly? Okay, so the first step is your bar diagram should convey all the information in the problem. Okay? So draw a diagram that conveys. all of the information in the problem. What I tell my students is, you know that you have a, oh, sorry, question. Do you not do the six steps? No, no eight steps. No well, eight steps. Well, they condense it down to six now. Oh. That's how we do it. That's why I'm like lost here. Okay, well, so, I'd really like you to kind of forget that if you can. I know it's hard, but I don't know, are people familiar with the eight-step method for solving word problems, which apparently now is the six-step method? That's what we teach our children. Yes. 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 That's yes. the way we do. They memorize yeah. the steps. Well, I do that. Okay. Um, I can tell you flat out that I've worked with teachers that have used that, and there are certain pro problems where it's wrong when you do it that way. Um, part of the, I mean, there. I don't want to talk about it because I, I don't want to advocate it. I mean, I know it's really tempting, and a lot of times when we learn something new, 
it, we feel a lot more comfortable if we have something to fall back on, like an algorithm, like a recipe, like an eight-step method. But it's really, it, it implies that kind of one size fits all, that you can do kind of all problems with these same eight steps, which is not true. Some of the steps are kind of useless, and there are types of problems, because I worked with students at Seven Hill, I had to talk class at Seven Hills a couple years ago, and they were doing the eight steps, and there were problems where they would draw, they, one of the steps is start with bars the same length. And then you go from there. And I, there are certain problems where you're just flat wrong when you do that. So I know it's hard to tell you to forget something that you've been doing, but I really like you to. I think it's going to, and maybe you can judge at the end. I mean, I'll, maybe I'll do it a different way. And if you prefer the eight steps, well, you know, whatever works for you. But maybe this will be something different. Okay, <clears throat> okay so again, how, I, how you know if you have a good picture is if you can well, what I used to tell my students is if you can solve the problem just from the picture, so you don't have to go back and read it, but actually my colleague, Dr. Bisk, actually went one step further, and he actually says you should be able to recreate the problem without reading it. You should be able to recreate the problem just from your picture. That's how you know you have everything, and that's a real good way of thinking about it. You should be able to recreate the problem from the diagram alone. So let's give that a whirl with this problem. Okay. John weighs three times as much as his daughter. Okay. Now, more often than not, I'm never going to say always, because there's always exceptions to the rule. And that's why these steps are a little dangerous. But more often than not, if you have two quantities, you have a bar, you have a bar for each quantity, I should say. So we have John and we have his daughter. Okay? So we want to clearly label our bars. And I just think it's cleaner if you have your labels off to the left. It just seems like things work cleaner that way. Now, how are we going to draw the bars? And I know the people that have done this before are only going to want to jump in, but uh, try to see the floor to the people that haven't, and then you can't see it all. I'll ask you guys. But how would we draw the bars for, for John and his daughter? If John weighs three times as much as his daughter, like whose bar should we start by drawing? The daughter or John's? Yeah, well, if we drew John's, then it'd kind of be hard to draw the daughter's, right? Because how? what's the daughter's bar compared to John's? A third of it. Wouldn't it be easier to start with the daughter's? and then just draw John's as being three times as long. Mm -hmm. So let's do that. So let's just start with drawing a bar for the daughter. Now, do we want to just eyeball this and say, well, that looks like it's three times as long. Is that useful? This doesn't really show that it's three times as long. We want three exact units. If the daughter's box is a unit, then John should be three exact units. And actually, because I've done this a lot, I have the amazing ability to just do it. Well, it's not that. It's a little bit off. So doesn't this convey the fact that John's bar is exactly three times as long as his daughter's bar, which represents the fact that he weighs three times as much as his daughter? Right? Okay, are we done? Certainly not. We can't recreate the problem from this picture. All we can recreate is the first sentence. Their combined weight is 288. So if you add up the lengths of the two bars, it's 288. So you might do something like this. A little bracket kind of that covers both bars and shows that 288 is the whole length. Are we done? Not quite, because if we just had this as our diagram, we wouldn't know what to answer, right? We're going to use question marks for unknowns. We're interested in John's weight. So let's just slap a question mark there. And I think we're okay, right? I mean, if we weren't, if we just looked at the picture, could we recreate the problem? John weighs three times as much as his daughter. Their combined weight is 288. How much does John weigh? We can, right? Good. That is the first step in a teacher's solution. Okay? But again, this step is going to vary based on the problem. No, okay so far? Yes. I like that models are slightly different. I mean, I 
I would actually go to one bar, even though there's two people there. Okay. Um, it's just harder to, I think it's easier to see the relationship three times as long. I mean, it's very, I mean, if you have one bar. Can I mark that? 288 divided by 4 times. It just depends on visually. I mean, I, I think it's easier to see that John's three times as much there as it would be if you were to do John and his daughter here. I mean, I don't think it is terribly different. I mean, if a student of mine did this, I would not count it wrong. It's not wrong. It's just a matter of what is the easiest thing to see. It, how, is it easier to see the relationship? I mean, if you can see the relationship this way, that's fine. And then you would label the whole bar 288. You're going to end up getting exactly the same type of solution we get here. I think I, I, think I just go to the them, so I'm going to hold this okay. No, that's, I mean, that's, uh, this is just my first instinct for how to draw it. We're going to see a lot of examples where, you know, there's more than one way to draw the picture. So this is okay. Right, like if it was a comparison, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And the, the only issue here is if I asked how much heavier is John than his daughter, it's going to be really hard to model that here, right? Because where are you going to put your question mark? That's difficult. Does everyone see? But you're right. I mean, that would be a comparison situation, and maybe your instincts would be, okay, two bars if it's a comparison. Good point. Okay. All right. So... The next step is what, when I do these with teachers, is the step that they get kind of hung up on. Most every teacher can look at this and get the answer, okay? at least when I've been working with them in the past. But I also want to remind you that the goal, I mean, sure, one of the goals of, of this demonstration is to get the answer. But another goal is to present a solution that can really be paralleled algebraically. Okay, so this is where I really want to insist on using units to solve this problem. And all of those diagrams I drew at the beginning, multiplication and division, that's what we want to use here. Okay? So my second stage, at least in problems, this is not a blanket statement, okay? Because there are some problems like the, the boys and girls problem that was just a subtraction problem that is not going to involve a, a kind of a step like this. The boys-girls problem, once you draw the picture, it's almost automatic what the arithmetic is, so you can kind of just write it and solve the problem. But with the multiplication and division problems, I write what is called a, this is kind of a phrase that I coined, a unit sentence. This is a direct interpretation of the diagram. What I tell my students is the first step is no math. As teachers, we are, again, or as, as adults that are proficient in math, we are inclined to just try to get the answer as fast as possible and maybe skip some steps. If your students were as proficient as you were at this, they wouldn't need this process to be Right? So what we want to do, and we want to catch ourselves, your first step in your explanation of your diagram, when I say no math, I mean you're not doing any computation. You're just reading the picture. Okay? When I say a unit sentence, I mean something like this. Some number of units equals some number. Now, if you can get to this step, you're done. The problem does itself after this. This is the key to any problem. I should say any problem involving multiplication and division. This is the key. If you can get to this step, it's all over. Because arithmetic takes us the rest of the way. Now, sometimes this is easier than others. In this problem, it's not too tough, right? How many units corresponds with a specific number in this picture? Four. One, two, three, four units are the combined number of units in the picture, and 288 is the combined length of the bars, right? So four units is exactly the same as 288. See what I mean by no math? You're just reading the picture. You're not doing, trying to skip steps, because if you skip steps on the board, if you go right to one unit equals 72, because you did in your head, 
your students are going to say, where did that come from? Right? Well, they should be able to see this because all they have to do is look at the picture. Right? Now, do you see what I mean by when I say arithmetic takes care of the rest of the problem? Because they know part of two division. And if they know that four of something is 288, then they should know how to find one of those things. What do you do with the 288? Divide by four. So one unit is 288 divided by four, which I think is 72. And how many units are we interested in? We're interested in three units. Well, they also know models of multiplication. So if one of something is 72, three of that same thing is 72 times three, right? Which is what, 216? Mm -hmm. You always tell your students to write a complete sentence answer. John weighs 216 pounds. Okay. So the second stage of the problem solving process over this so-called teacher solution is to write a unit sentence and then write out clearly explain the arithmetic that solves the problem. And all I mean by that is your four units is 288, down to one, up to three. And of course the last step is complete sentence answer. And again, the reason why I really want to focus on being so particular, and I'm, I freely admit that I'm terribly, terribly nitpicky when I grade problems like this, is because can you see how this exact solution can be parallel to an algebraic solution? All you have, exactly, units are x. 4x equals 288 is obvious if you are proficient at doing something. Okay, of course, it takes a while for us to really get a handle on what is x. It's very abstract, so that's why we push it off until they're ready for that. But if they've been doing problems like this all the way through elementary school, I would think that algebra is going to be a lot smoother transition. And then in the fourth grade, rather than writing units, they just become u, which is the same. Oh, they even do that in fourth yeah, grade? So like four wow. To Eight, so wow. Because it just made sense to them that you meant you. You mean the whole So it was just like, it eventually turned Oh, well, that's, and then you can mean anything. Oh, that's. Okay, questions here? Okay. Um, so this is what I mean by teacher solution. So when we start doing these on our own, I just, I mean, I know it's going to be hard, especially if you've, if you've been doing these problems in a different way, or if you've never seen it before, but you're just used to, oh, I just want to get to the answer. Just try, okay? I, I promise you that all the problems that I give you can be solved with units. Now, I don't want to imply that every single word problem you will ever find in elementary school can be solved with this bar diagram <coughs> method, right? In fact, we're gonna, when we talk about ratio, it turns out that ratio, uh, the concept of ratio and the way we define ratio in this textbook fits perfectly in with this idea of units, right? I mean, the ratio of, I mean, if you talk about a ratio A to B, I mean, what that really means is there's some unit out there so that one quantity measures A units and the other one measures B units. So if you have the, something in the ratio of four to three, that means there's a unit out there, so the first one's four units and the second one's three units. I'll bet you can already figure out how you would draw a bar diagram for that. In fact, even though that we're not gonna talk about ratios today, I'm gonna give you a ratio problem on the homework because I'll bet you can do it. And I'll give you some fraction problems on the homework too because I'll bet you can do those too. All right, we'll do a few more examples and discuss this further and then we'll set you loose on problems. Let me just really quickly discuss, I don't want to blow over the kind of thir the early third grade problems that just deal with addition and subtraction because again, they're, they're useful problems too. I just know a lot of, most of you teach higher grades than that. Um, a lot of these types of problems are found in the pink book early on. Uh, so if you just flip through this, you see you know, bar diagrams all over the place. So. Yeah, like on page page 20 of the pink book, um, there are several problems that deal with either addition or subtraction. So with addition and subtraction, your step two 
is not going to involve a unit sentence. There's no need for units when you have just addition and subtraction, right? I mean, the units come up with multiplication and division. And by the way, if you want a, the teacher's solution, there is a, in the textbook, they have the kind of teach, if you need easy, quick access to that, it's on page 55. I basically just kind of paraphrased and, and added some stuff, but they do have features of a teacher solution on page 55 of your main text. Okay. All right, so I'll just maybe pick, I mean, you can look at these as well as I can, but if you see a problem like, well, like number four with Mary. Mary made 686 cookies. She sold some of them. If 298 were left over, how many did she sell? So she made, I'm just going to draw the picture. She made 686 cookies. And really, we're breaking these cookies up to the number that she sold and the number she didn't sell. Okay? She sold some of them, and 298 were left over, and we're interested in how many she sold. If you want to label this bar cookies, that's fine. Go right ahead. So you can see that a problem like this that really just involves subtraction, we don't have any need for units. In fact, we don't even have units on this problem, right? Because units are portions of the diagram that are exactly the same piece, the same size, right? That is not coming into play here. I remember, again, the goal of all of this is just to get to the right arithmetic. Well, the right arithmetic here is pretty obvious from the picture if we understand our full subtraction. Right. So all I would need to see for your teacher solution is just the correct arithmetic. 686 minus 298. And you might use a mental math technique to do 686 minus 298, right? What would you do? 4 minus 300. 688 minus 300. Add 2 to both for our 388. And what was it asking for? The ones she sold or the ones she gave away? She sold some, right? So she sold 388 ones. Right? We're okay with something like this. So um, this is really, there's, ter there's not a terrible amount of work to show when we have our work problems that just deal with addition and subtraction. Okay, so there are a couple of the homework problems. I think they're, they're the beginning ones where the, it's just addition and subtraction. And really all I want to see is the picture and then the arithmetic that you pick right off the picture. Okay? Um, and on the, the sheet that I'm going to give you, the first problem is one like that and the rest of them are multiplication and division. So you'll do some ones. Question? Is that a question for the... Sure. Sorry, because I was in the bathroom. Oh, no. Um, for number two, when you write a unit sentence, yeah, can, see, you, can you do equals x or equals unit or no, not very Well, there's, it's not necessary. Um, and really, we want to, I mean, units really are part of the diagram that's the same size in places, okay, so right? So, yeah, and it's not necessary, right? It's just not necessary. I mean, the whole goal is the picture shows us what the right arithmetic is. Okay. And this picture shows it to us immediately. Right? Actually, you could just write that. You could just write this, okay. yeah. And also, if you had a problem that said, Mary made some cookies, she sold 388 of them, and she didn't sell 200, or she had 298 of them left over, how many did she make? It's the same situation, right? This is just an addition problem. There's no need for a unit, because as soon as you draw this, you know the right arithmetic. I mean, that's the goal, is to get to the right arithmetic, 298, plus 388. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Other questions on what we've done so far? Okay, let me also, let me do a, pro a type of problem that is slightly trickier. So that, if, the, if it's okay, I'm not gonna really focus on the addition and subtraction problems anymore. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Let me focus on a problem that is a little <coughs> trickier than this one. Now, we're going to notice when we're dealing with whole numbers that there's really two types of ways that the quantities can be related to one another. And it's kind of like an easy way and hard way. <coughs> In this problem, John's weight is an exact 
multiple of its daughter's weight, right? Very easy to draw the picture in this case. And when I say easy, I mean after you've practiced. So very easy to draw the picture, very easy to interpret the picture, because everything's exactly the same size, right? But there are ways that we can relate numbers where we are not given that one number is a multiple of another. Consider this. A table and chair costs $168 altogether. So right off the bat, it kind of is similar to that problem because we have similar information. However, what if we know that the table costs $110 more than the chair? And of course, I can ask you for the table or the chair. I'll just ask you for the cost of the table. What is the cost of the table? So you are not told that the table is a certain, the price of the table, I should say, is a certain multiple of the price of the chair. Right? So it's a different relationship between the two quantities as in the John and his daughter problem. Okay. Let's just give it a go. Now, I don't want to imply that this problem cannot be done with one bar. It's just that I've done this problem many, many times. So I know the two bars, or at least to me, is a little more clear. Now, if we're drawing these bars, how do we draw them? We draw a long one and a short one. Which one's long? The table costs more, so it's long. The chair costs less, so it's short. But we cannot do anything more, well, we can do something a little bit more than this, but we can't chop the table into pieces. So we're not given that information. You're not told the table is three times as much as the chair or four times as much. It might not even be a whole number multiple. Right? It probably isn't. Okay. But we can do something with that 110, right? And this is comparison. So where would that 110 go? Right in the gap either between the chair and the end of the table bar. Or a little thing you can do is you can kind of cut the table bar off where the chair bar would end and stick the 110 there. There, it's, it's equivalent. OK, are we quite done with our picture? Question mark, right? So we are interested in the cost of the table in this case. So now we're done, right? Can you recreate the problem from this picture? Sure. A table costs, oh, no, not that. Table costs 110 more than the chair. Combined cost is 168. How much is the table cost? OK, so it hasn't been terribly painful so far. Um, it's a little bit different, but we can still kind of figure this out how to write. However, the unit sentence, we have to scratch our heads a little bit. Remember that units are pieces of the diagram that are the same size. So where do we have things that are the same size? The chair and the beginning part of the table. Right? So that's two units. There are two things that are the same size. What's two units exactly the same as? One hundred and ten less than one sixty-eight, right? Because if you chop off that extra one ten, you're going to get two exact units. The whole way is one sixty-eight, so if you want to chop one ten off of that, you have to subtract one ten from one sixty-eight. See what I mean? It's a little tricky. Sometimes bars are too long. Sometimes bars are too short. However, you can adjust your bars that are too long or too short to make them units. If they're too long, you chop them down. If they're too short, you make them longer. Is everyone okay with that? And then you get units, and then you get a unit sense. You have to get a unit sense. You're not going to be able to solve these problems in this way if you don't get to a unit sense. Right? I'm not saying you can't solve the problem. You can use another technique, but you're not going to be able to solve it using this technique if you don't come to a unit sense somehow. Okay? 
And as soon as we get to that unit sentence, by the way, it's all over, right? It is all over. So this is two units equals 58. And of course, our students know that if two of something is one or is 58, then one of that same thing is 58 divided by two, which is what 29. And then I look to my question mark, and what do I have to do to that 29? Add 110. 29 plus 110 is 139. The table costs $139. You doing okay? Questions so far? Okay. What was our unit in this problem? The chair was the unit, right? Can we do this problem if we consider the table as the unit? Why not? As I mentioned a second ago, sometimes the bars are too long, sometimes the bars are too short. Yeah. If we consider the chair as the unit, the bars are too the table bar is too long, so we had to chop it down. Mm -hmm. However, if we consider the table as the unit, then the chair bar is too short. And the only reason I'm doing this, you might say, why are you doing it this way? That way is so much easier. The only reason I'm doing it this way is you might have other problems where a bar is too long. Or sorry, a bar is too short. Do you guys kind of get what I mean when I say bar too long, bar too short? Here, if a chair is the unit, then the table bar is too long. So we have to chop it down to make it equivalent to a unit. We have to subtract what we chopped off. Mm -hmm. However, if you consider a table as a unit, then, what's our unit sentence? If the table is the unit, how would we get to two units? It's harder to see because it's not on the picture, right? It's not there. Here it's there, right? This little piece is already there so you can see it. It's not here, it's invisible. What would you have to do to the chair's bar to make it into a unit if the table's the unit? Add one to ten, right? So if the table were the unit, we would have two tables is the 168. 168 gets us to right here, right? So then we have to add 110. Right, so you, well, for, and, we, and we can see again how it translates to algebra. Exactly. And then, dot, dot, dot. So of course, when you get a unit now, you got the answer. Right? Because if the table's a unit, the table's exactly what we're looking for. Now again, you might be saying, well, why this way? It's harder than that. Well, there might be problems out there where you have to make bars longer. Right? In fact, I think there's probably one of them. Okay. Questions? <laughs> because we're looking, looking scared. I promise you you'll be able to go. Um, can we do one with fractions? Now keep in mind, we're having an entire day on fractions, and we're going to do all the stuff with fractions again. Okay? So we're jumping to, I'm just going to pick a problem from the book, it's actually on page 154, number 3A. But I promise you that you can, now that you have the hang of this, you can do these problems. And you can do ratio problems too. Okay, so this problem reads, after spending four-sevenths of her money on a jacket. So we're on page 154. I'll write it up for you. After spending four-sevenths of her money on a jacket, Rita had $36 left. How much did she start with? Now, we've been doing model drawing for half hour, 40 minutes, not even that long probably. And we haven't said a word about fractions at all. 
Well, I've said a few words about it, but we haven't developed anything about fractions. Nevertheless, I think we can all solve this problem. When in doubt, when you're doing fraction models, just draw a bar. What does a bar or a circle or a rectangle represent when you are dealing with fractions? The whole, okay? So what would this bar represent? For, for a total amount of money. And that's exactly what we're interested in here, aren't we? How many pieces do you suppose we're gonna chop this bar into? Good guess. Not even a guess. You knew it. How am I going to fill out the rest of this problem? She spent four sevenths of her money on a jacket, and four sevenths is certainly four fractional units out of seven total. And then? And then put the little line and the 36 over the last thing. She had $36 left over. How much did she have at first? You guys already told me that the whole bar represented her total amount of money. Mm -hmm. What's a unit sentence? Three units equals 36. One unit equals 36 divided by 3 or 12. How many units are we interested in? All of them. Seven units equals 12 times 7. <laughs> Told you you do it. There's nothing tricky about that. You see the picture? So after we draw the picture, one, they're all the same. I mean, that's what fractions are, right? When you chop into pieces, all the fractional units are the same size. One, two, three units is the same as 36. And as soon as you get that unit sentence, it's all over. Doesn't matter what type of problem you're dealing with. Ratio, percent, whole number, <coughs> fraction, doesn't matter. As soon as you get the unit sentence, your arithmetic takes care of the rest. Yeah, 30. Or 36 is three. Yeah, 36 is three sevenths of what? I mean, this is really yeah. hard to division, right? Because you can recognize this as 36 divided by three sevenths. 36 is three sevenths of what? It's exactly the same question that we use for partitive division. And in fact, tomorrow or Thursday or whenever we do that, we'll use that exact same language. Exactly right. And then the key will be once you have a problem that's that's like that, like, like you just phrased, you'll be able to draw this picture and you'll be able to solve it. Now, again, remember, the, the goal of it, I mean, it would, it would be much more beneficial if students immediately realized that the arithmetic is 36 divided by 3 sevenths. But you know, it's a multi step problem, it's a little tricky. Um, so, I mean, really, what did we do? We divided by 3 and we multiplied by 7 to get the answer. We multiply by 7 thirds, the same as dividing by 3 sevenths. Okay. okay, you okay? Can I just say, that I'm just going to laugh, but I just use the model drawing on the MSL too. Really? There are a couple questions where I get frustrated sometimes, I get over stressed out, even look at the question. And <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. But I actually stopped and drew it out, and it helped. There you I go. I know you're trying to get away from that as you get older, but it you know, No, absolutely Especially not. in the multi-step problem no, that you have. Of course not. There's no. like five or six steps. No, I, just absolutely just not. I mean, if you, that, that's exactly what the, this, I mean, when, if you can do the model drawing, then you, you, that means that you kind of know what's going on behind the scenes, right? right? So that's why we teach stuff like this, because if you kind of forget how to do it algebraically or how to just get the arithmetic straight away, then we kind of just, all right, go back to step one and build it up. So that's great. Right.